Hi, good afternoon or good morning, everyone, uh, depending on where this broadcast finds you. I'm glad you could all join us. And I'm going to let, looks like there's a few more people settling in uh, virtually, getting their audio to connect. So I'm just going through to make sure we've got everybody settled in here. Give everybody a couple of minutes. There's a few more that are connecting their audio. And then we'll get started. We've got uh, a really great uh, presentation today, a lot of information to share with you, um, and we're looking forward to that. For many of you, this may be uh, a review, um, and for some of you, it may be some, some concepts or ideas that you're uh, hearing about or learning for the first time. So we welcome you all. Uh, this is our ongoing series. My name is Steve Steine. I'm one of the... Um, managers here at our center, University of Iowa, the National American Indian Alaska Native ATTC, uh, broadcasting to you from the University of Iowa campus. Uh, we're happy to have you all here with us. So um, today our on, we have an ongoing series, Essential Substance Abuse Skills. Today we're going to be um, <clears throat> sharing with you information about basic counseling skills. Uh, I'm, I'm your host, and then we also have our speaker today, Dr. Avis Garcia. Uh, she's got a lot of information to share. So hopefully you can close out some of your other programs and <clears throat> kind of open your mind up to, to some learning today and take a break from maybe what you're working on uh, on the side. So just a couple of things to go over with you all before I turn the floor over to Dr. Garcia. Uh, one of them is that this event is brought to you by the National American Indian Alaska Native Addiction Technology Transfer Center. As I mentioned, we are located at the University of Iowa, and we are part of a national ATTC network that includes 10 regional centers. This project is supported by SAMHSA, and just to, just to keep in mind, the content uh, is developed by the presenters, and the opinions expressed uh, today do not necessarily reflect the views or policies of SAMHSA, HHS, or <clears throat> the American Indian Alaska Native, ATTC. <clears throat> Following today's event, we will send out a follow-up email which will include links to the presentation, slides, uh, any other documents. I think Dr. Garcia has a couple of other supplemental handouts that we'll include, uh, and there'll be a recording available of this broadcast posted within a few days <clears throat> at our uh, secure ATTC YouTube archive website. Um, if you're interested in getting CEUs for this event, You'll also have an opportunity to request those when you receive the uh, email with this information along with a brief survey. <clears throat> so as I, as I said, at the end of today's event, we will share a link in the chat box um, regarding the survey. Uh, this survey is, is, is very important to us at the center and to our funders and to ensure that we can continue to provide events like this uh, to, to participants. Uh, your participation in this survey is voluntary, but we really uh, encourage you to take a few minutes to help us complete this brief survey. You can skip any questions you would like, <clears throat> uh, and all your responses will be kept confidential and not linked to you in any way. But certainly reach out to myself or Ella Driscoll, who is here on the call with us for technical support, uh, as well as Dr. Garcia, if you have any questions about the survey. As all of you know, um, you're currently muted. Um, please use the chat box feature or the hand raise feature during today's broadcast if you would like to make any comments or questions uh, during the course of today's presentation. We may have some time at the end too to field questions or for you to unmute and ask questions directly to our presenter. I want to take a few moments now uh, to, to acknowledge that we are uh, gathered here virtually today 
but I want to uh, acknowledge and pay respect to the indigenous nations whose homelands were forcibly taken and inhabited. Please take a few moments to read this land acknowledgement, which was created by two members, excuse me, by three members of our uh, ATTC, ATTC team, Ella and Keely Driscoll and our co-director, Sean Baer. Thank you. And without further ado, I would like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Avis Garcia. <clears throat> she is an enrolled member of the Northern Arapaho Nation and affiliated with the Eastern Shoshone Tribe of Wyoming. Really happy to have her here. Um, she is a great speaker and uh, a friend and a colleague, and we're happy to have her as part of our uh, consultant team here at the ATTC. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Avis Garcia and we'll begin today's presentation. Thank you. Oops, sorry. Are we good now? I just need to have you hit this the share screen and we'll get your we'll get your slides up. Just like we practiced, uh, Doc. Share screen. Share. Perfect. Looks great. Okay. Yep. If if do we want to have her put that in? Can you guys see that in presentation mode? It looks great. Okay, Love it. good, Thank good, you. good. Okay, just a brief little bit about myself. Uh, they already mentioned I'm from the Wind River Reservation in Wyoming. I am a licensed addictions therapist and professional counselor for the last two decades of my life. I have my doctorate in counselor education and supervision, and I've specialized in addictions and trauma. I am also an advocate of education in Indian country. And I am currently employed as an executive director of a nonprofit substance abuse treatment center here in Cheyenne, Wyoming right now. Okay, today's presentation is on the basic counseling skills. The objectives of this session are to provide counselors and other helping professionals with the basic knowledge of major theoretical approaches to addiction and general counseling for the counseling skills exam, if anybody's getting ready to sit for that. We will cover counselor development, micro counseling skills, counseling theory, self-disclosure and keeping clear boundaries and cultural and ethnic issues. So we have a lot of material to go over. To begin with, here's this slide here. It says a person's substance use is not the problem but rather a symptom of an underlying issue for which they have yet to find a meaningful solution. And in all my years of work, I think as I do the uh, trauma presentations, I've shared that I've discovered a lot of uh, clients in treatment have a lot of trauma issues and they don't always aren't forthcoming with it early in their treatment pro process. Moving on to counselor development, we're looking at the process of thinking and reasoning. That's global versus linear thinking. And this is how we all think differently. People don't think the same. So the global thinking process where the answer is stated within the argument, it assumes to be true what you are trying to prove. The conclusion is a single assumption. It has a certain starting point. The process tends to jump forward and side to side through the steps of a project in an effort to see the big picture. Uh, global learners need to see the overall picture first. They need to understand the relevance of the information being presented. Without this, they will feel lost and bored if they are not given a sense of direction regarding where the learning is headed. 
They feel uncomfortable and quickly lose interest. From this perspective, it's important for teachers, trainers, and professors to provide a big picture at the start of any training program and also at the beginning of each day or session. Global learners see themselves as someone who will benefit from creating a learning map of the entire process. Global versus linear. Linear thinking is the process of thought following known step by step process, progress wherein a response to a step must be elicited before taking another step. And it has a starting point and an end point. Uh, significant difference between circular and linear thinking is global, the conclusion is contained in a single creative assumption. Linear thinking, the conclusion is derived from multiple assumptions. Linear learners need, to, need a step-by-step -step explanation of the topic. They need a specific orderly flow of information or they lose their focus. They prefer to concentrate on a single task at a time, though they can multitask if the tasks are put in an orderly sequence. The special features of linear learners include they are analytical by nature, they compare and contrast facts to understand them, they are usually more verbally oriented, are usually left brain learners, they need structure and logical progression, they relate to written materials with a traditional outline format. They dislike surprises such as pop quizzes and spot role plays. The learning process. We have the visual learners and there's some examples below each one of what Bill's meets that category. There are the auditory learners and there are the kinesthetic learners. The visual learners are those who learn through seeing things look over the characteristics to see if they sound familiar. A visual learner is good, at, is good at spelling, but forgets names, needs quiet study time, has to think a while before understanding lecture and is good at spelling, likes colors and fashion, dreams and color, understands, likes charts, is good with sign language, visual learners can benefit from drawing a map of events in history to draw a scientific process, make outlines of everything, copy what's on the board, ask the teacher to diagram and diagram sentences, taking notes, making lists, watching videos, color code words, research notes, outline reading, using flashcards, using highlighters, circling words, underlining. Best type for visual learners is diagramming, reading maps and essays. And listening and responding to tests. And so the kinesthetic learning is a combination of both of these. So. Okay, how do you learn and process information? Global or linear thinking? How do you process information that's presented to you? Who in your life do you believe processes information on the other end of the scale from you? How do you adjust your communication when speaking with a person who processes differently than you? Visual or auditory or kinesthetic, how do you best, how do you feel that you learn the best? So you can feel free to leave your comments in the, the chat box. I see myself as a kinesthetic learner. I have to have a little bit of both. Poll question number one, what type of learning processes do you most identify with? Visual, auditory, kinesthetic, or you don't identify with any of these more than the others. The integrated developmental model. This is noted by Stoltenberg, McNeil and Dalworth in 1988 where clinicians develop in a step-by-step -step approach. Clinicians are seen to move through three levels of development in a relatively orderly fashion relevant to professional activities. The model allows for brief regressions when clinicians are faced with new or ambiguous tasks. So if you think of this as a progressive theory of your professional development, 
as clinicians working in the behavioral health field. So this is how we think in the work that we do as substance abuse counselors. The integrated developmental model is where people are continuously growing and growth is not linear, but specific, or sporadic, sorry. Growth can be affected by changes such as your caseload, your treatment setting, your supervisory relationship, and the population served. So this makes sense to me with all of my years of training in working with new clinicians entering the field. It's very important to provide step-by-step -step orientation and clinical training, starting with many of the uh, the current assessment and evaluation processes used to determine the patient's social and diagnostic histories. Integrated developmental model. Again, this is the levels of counselor development. There is the beginning, the intermediate, and the advanced. Some overriding structures are self and other awareness, motivation, and autonomy. The integrated developmental model continued has eight growth areas, including intervention skills, assessment techniques, interpersonal assessment, patient conceptualization, individual differences, theoretical orientation, treatment plans, and goals and professional ethics. So all of this is building a foundation of a house that you need to build a solid foundation to stand and function as you continue your work as a substance abuse counselor. Some levels of counselor development are beginning, that's level one. So you're probably fresh out of grad school and on your first job. There's intermediate and um, level two. And then there's the advanced level three. So in level one, again, the clinicians fresh out of school, they're full of trust and hope and they're all willing to help all the people are ready to save the world <laughs> at least I think I was when I first started and then level two is the confusion stage you're striving for independence less imitated sometimes there's rigid attitudes and belief systems and there's some ambivalence and instability so for example, we could start to see our clients relapsing and we may think we're, we're causing it or we're not doing a good job. So it's being able to find what works for you because as counselors, we all approach our work from different perspectives as well. And level three is the calm after the storm. Being able to concentrate demonstrates development and learning is a lifelong process. I would describe level three as the beginning of the clinician's true work experience as the clinician develops beyond the stage of growth and understanding their work will take on more meaningful professionally, personally, and spiritually uh, approach. So it's finding what works for you. And I've been working in substance abuse for 20 years now, and I learn something new every day. So we're always working to improve our skills Micro counseling skills. Micro counseling skills are by Alan Ivey, a distinguished university professor at the Massachusetts University of Massachusetts Amherst and a professor of counseling at the University of South Florida in Tampa. Alan is an author and co author of more than 40 books, 200 articles, and chapters translated into 18 languages. He is the originator of the micro skills approach. Here are a couple of the books uh, that he's co-authored. Uh, the Intentional Interviewing and Counseling, Facilitating Patient Development in a Multicultural Society, and Essentials of Inter Intentional Interviewing, Counseling in a Multicultural World. Microcounseling is an analysis of counseling skills that looks carefully and in great detail at the elements of the counseling relationship. Regardless of the aims and methods of 
a counseling relationship, understanding its micro elements helps clinicians improve their counseling effectiveness. Attending and attending behavior. Attending the counselor's interest in the patient is demonstrated by eye contact, body posture, and accurate verbal following. And then attending behavior, this is where we encourage the patients to talk, and we also are actively listening to what they are sharing. These skills can be learned, but it would be safe to venture to say that those of you listening today are more likely innately gifted with many of these skills already, or you wouldn't be involved in the helping profession. So um, the micro counseling skills uh, comes from uh, working with um, people in treatment and it can start at any time of the treatment process. And I like to use that in, in the intake and assessment process. The next slide, open and closed questions. Open questions can't be answered in a few words. We offer encouragement and the patient will speak more. Closed question focuses on the dialogue, tends to turn the focus on the professional and away from the patient. You may be caught in a question and answer trap. So closed questions are one answer responses, usually yes or no. Patient observation skills, reflective listening, nonverbal behavior. 85% of communication is all the nonverbal behavior. Verbal behavior focuses on key words. There's discrepan if there's discrepancies in patient's communication, there may be some mixed messages, contraindications, conflicts, and incongruities. And the bottom here says the task is not to problem solve, but to understand where the patient is coming from. So when we're looking at the nonverbals, we're paying attention to body language. How's the attention and the support? Eye contact to show respect and attention. Touch, um, you have to be very cautious with that. And time of being there. Encouraging, paraphrasing, and summarizing are all a part of the reflective listening skills. So you would want to um, make sure that they, the questions that you're asking are being understood and paraphrasing and summarizing the information that's shared in the sessions as you work with the clients. Reflecting your feelings. The patient's feelings are either stated or implied as expressed by the counselor. Feelings of the patient can be verbal and nonverbal. Reflecting meaning, finding the deeply held thoughts and feelings underlying life experience. Paraphrasing is thought as reflection is, is to thought as reflection is to feelings, breaks down complex behavior into parts. Empathy is understanding what the patient is experiencing and putting oneself in the patient's place. Functions of empathy, it builds a firmer relationship with the patient. It enables the counselor to better understand the patient's behavior and common problems with conveying empathy are language and cultural differences between the patient and the counselor. Poll question number two, which of these micro counseling skills is most challenging for you? Is it attending behavior, open versus closed questions, reflective listening or empathy? Counseling perspective theory is the psychoanalytic perspective is the first one here consists largely of using methods to bring out the unconscious working through past transference relationships focuses on childhood experiences 
And in big bold letters there, trainings required beyond the scope of most clinicians, including myself. I often refer patients for psychological or psychiatric evaluations when necessary. This requires an advanced degree in psychology or psychiatry. It's required. The psychoanalytic perspective is by Sigmund Freud. Uh, if you remember this from psychology, I think the very first psychology class I had where there's a struggle between the life and death instincts at the heart of human nature, dynamics of the unconscious and its influence on behavior, role of anxiety mo motivates us to do something and the personality structure is divided into components of the id, ego, and superego. So the id and the superego ego are constantly in conflict with each other, and the ego tries to resolve the conflict. If this conflict is not resolved, we tend to use defense mechanisms to reduce our anxieties, and psychoanalysis attempts to help patients resolve inner conflicts. And so this is development of personality at various life periods. So there's different stages of life that we go through. More on the psychoanalytic perspective with Eric Erickson is broadened the developmental perspective beyond early childhood, establishes balance between ourselves and the social world, biosocial approach, Crisis is equivalent to a turning point. Ego, developing strength and ways to deal with life tasks and personality stages. The next one is Carl Jung, a psychological aspect of personality development during midlife, views humans positively, Individualization, individuation, spiritual approach, the meaning of life, constant development, growth, and moving toward a balanced and complete level. The overview of psychoanalytic perspective, the limitations are a lack of ego strength needed for change, a biological predisposition, Great responsibility is placed on parenting. So that's the mothers and the fathers. The, um, it's a long-term therapy, so it, it can be difficult uh, as far as the outcomes go. And not too many people in substance abuse treatment are wanting to be in a long-term therapy. Uh, some contributions are the conceptual framework for looking at behavior. Past experiences may pertain to the current life value and role of transference. Overuse of ego defenses can keep patients from functioning effectively and also the role of early childhood on development. The Adlerian perspective, the goal is to help patients identify and change their mistaken beliefs about life and thus participate more fully in the social world People need to understand and confront basic mistakes. Family is an important factor. And cooperative therapy between the clinician and the patient. Alfred Adler considered human beings as, individual, as an individual whole. Therefore, he called his psychology individual psychology. He was also the first to emphasize the importance of the social element in the readjustment process of an individual and carried psychiatry into the community. The limitations of the Adlerian perspective are difficult to empirically validate the basic hypotheses, detailed exploration of early childhood, early memories and dynamics within the family, contributions, working out an addiction plan to make changes in life. People are social goal seeking decision makers, subjectively understanding the unique world of an individual and also sensitive to the cultural and gender issues. Next, we have the existential perspective by Viktor Frankl and Rollo May. This is a philosophical approach that influences the counselor patient therapeutic process. We are not the victim of circumstances because to a large extent, we are what we choose to be. 
self-awareness and therapy, a process of searching for the value and meaning in life. It's an individual's worldview. People are faced with the anxiety of choosing to create an identity in a world that lacks meaning. So taking that a little bit further, existential therapy can be highly effective for those who are struggling to make healthy life choices and accept the consequences of these choices. This can include individuals struggling with addiction, anxiety, depression, and a wide range of psychological and behavioral issues. As with most forms of therapy, existential therapy is most beneficial for an individual who is willing to engage in honest self-evaluation. The existential perspective limitations, it lacks a systematic statement of the principles and practices of psychotherapy. It lacks rigorous methods. The concepts are abstract, highly focused on philosophical assumptions of self-determination. Contributions are the person is the central for focus, emphasis on the freedom, on the quality, of the therapeutic relationship, individual's freedom to redesign his or her life by choosing. Person-centered perspective is by Carl Rogers, often referred to as a Rogerian uh, counseling perspective. It is, focuses on the capability of self-directed growth, potential for understanding self resolving our own problems without therapist's direction or intervention the therapist's role is to be rather than to do something focuses on the person each of us has within us by nature a potential that we can actualize and through which we can find meaning this is the innate striving for self-actualization so this is letting the client be more involved in their treatment process from the very beginning, uh, letting them feel like they are in control and letting them make some decisions for themselves so that they can gain more trust in the experience. Limitations on the person-centered perspective are therapists tend to be supportive without being challenging. Limited techniques include attending and reflecting, the therapist's training has more emphasis on the attitudes of the counselor. All individuals may not have within them a growth potential or ability to trust their own directions. So again, it's not for everyone. Contributions, stated concepts as testable hypotheses and was submitted to research. And it is a non-directive counseling method. And I feel like this method uses all our basic counseling skills, our attending, our listening, our reflecting, building that alliance. So this is all a part of that. Motivational interviewing is a counseling approach developed in part by psychologists William R. Miller and Stephen Rolnick. It's a directive client-centered counseling style for eliciting behavior change, helping clients to explore and resolve ambivalence. Compared with non-directive counseling, it's more focused and goal-directed, departs from traditional Rogerian client-centered therapy through this use of direction where therapist attempts to influence clients to consider making changes rather than engaging in non-directive therapeutic exploration. The examination and resolution of ambivalence is a central purpose and the counselor is intentionally directive in pursuing this goal. MI is most centrally defined, not by technique, but by its spirit as a facilitative style for interpersonal relationship. Miller and Rolnick changed the terminology from rolling with resistance to dancing with discord in the third edition of their book, Motivational interviewing, a form of directive, client-centered psychotherapy where patients are encouraged to explore the discrepancies between what they hope to attain in their lives and how they currently live and behave. Using specific language and techniques to empower the patients toward a positive lifestyle change. So it's not our patients that are resistant, 
in denial are difficult, but rather it's how we as providers may be misreading their readiness to change, trying to push them into, trying to push them into rather than elicit the desire to change from within. Imparting information does not work effectively when the client isn't ready to hear it. So a lot of people come into treatment that are, they really don't want to be there. So uh, when we talk about going along with their resistance, we might want to, you know, let them know that, you know, I'm not really interested in what you don't want to do here. I'm more interested in what you're willing to do. And so usually in my situation, a lot of my clients are from the criminal justice population. So maybe they want to get they're on probation and they want to just be over it. So I'll let them know. So if you want to get off probation, you have to complete this program. So let me tell you everything that you need to do. So when you complete this program, you can return to doing whatever it is you want to do. So some people tend to make their uh, treatment complicated when it, they can make it more simplified for themselves. Motivational interviewing is considered an evidence-based practice for the treatment of substance abuse by SAMHSA and has been extensively applied in medical care as well as mental health and substance abuse treatment. So I've seen this used with uh, diabetes uh, programs as well. Motivational interviewing limitations does not address urgency of change, ineffective leaders, no methodology for resistive patients, contributions, it triggers change in high-risk lifestyle behaviors, increases the willingness to get help and fight through addiction, increases participation rates during any treatment program, and allows individuals to find encouragement during treatment and to establish their own self-actualization goals. On to the Gestalt perspective, we have Fritz Perls. Is an, this is an existential phenomenological approach based on the premise that people must find their own way in life and accept personal responsibility if they hope to achieve maturity. Therapists do not aim to change their patients, but rather assist in experiencing all feelings avoid interpretations and focus on patient behavior. So it is technique based and is also focused on patient's self-awareness. Limitations to the Gestalt perspective is the emphasis of the cognitions, that's our thinking. Not all, not, it's not for all patients. So we have to assess and, and monitor our patients to see what types of approaches are more effective because not everything, not one treatment modality is effective with everyone. So we have to be mindful of that. Contributions are the action approach, pays attention to both verbal and nonverbal cues. So if somebody is there in session with you and maybe they're playing with their hair or uh, messing with their um, just moving their fingers, funny, you might want to be like, I noticed you're touching your hair and your hands, are you nervous? Or can you tell me what that's about? So getting them to focus on what's going on here and now. William Glasser, this is probably one of my most favorite ones. And um, I'm sorry, I meant to put choice in there and it looks like it just has C. So it's choice and the reality perspective. This rejects the medical model. The patients live in an external and an internal world. Clinician's function is a teacher or a model. Focus on personal responsibility and gaining control. Total behavior. The patients have psychological needs for belonging, power, freedom, and fun. So this sees every patient that comes for help as they have some needs to belong to a group or an organization or even in the family and they want to feel like they have control and that it's fun. Glasser was a developer of reality therapy and choice theory. His ideas focus on personal choice, personal responsibility, and personal transformation 
are considered controversial by mainstream psychiatrists who focus instead on classifying psychiatric syndromes as illnesses and who often prescribe psychotropic medications to treat mental disorders. Glasser is notable for applying his theories to broader social issues such as education, management, and marriage. Glasser notably deviated from conventional psychiatrists by warning the general public about the potential detriment caused by the profession of psychiatry in its traditional form and the common goal to diagnose a patient with a mental illness, with a mental illness and prescribe medications. In fact, the patient may be simply be acting out of unhappiness and not having a brain disorder. Glasser advocated the consideration of mental health as a public health issue. The control reality perspective, the limitations, there's a de-emphasis on the counseling process. It does not take into account the unconscious, vulnerable to the counselor who assumes the role of an expert in deciding for others. Some contributions is its short-term focus dealing with conscious behavior. Contract approach, punishment and blaming is a basic reality. Psychosis can be related to unfulfilled needs. The behavior perspective is from Arnold Lazarus. There's the interplay between individual and the environment Emphasis is on specific goals at the onset of therapy. Based on scientific method, patients are expected to engage in specific actions to deal with problems. Therapist uses summarization, reflection, clarification, and open-ended questioning. Therapy is a collaborative partnership. Three major areas of development. In 19, 58, he introduced the terms behavior therapy and behavior therapist, and later broadened the focus of behavioral treatment to incorporate cognitive and other aspects. Lazarus expanded the scope of CBT to include physical sensations, visual images, and interpersonal relationships and biological factors. The final product of Arnold Lazarus' approach to psychotherapy is called multimodal therapy and shares many of its assumptions and theorizing with Ellis's rational emotive behavior therapy. Limitations of the behavior perspective are the cha it changes behaviors, but not the feelings, ignores the importance of relational factors, does not provide insight, treats symptoms rather than causes, involves total involves control and manipulation by the therapist. Contributions are cognitive factors and subjective reactions to people, of people to the environment, systematic behavioral techniques and ethical accountability. The cognitive behavior perspective, this is quite popular with uh, addiction treatment. And of course it has to do with our thinking and our behavior. This is, including uh, Albert Ellis, Aaron Beck, and Donald Meikenbaum. Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy, REBT, uh, thinking, judging, deciding, and doing. Emotions stem mainly from beliefs, evaluations, interpretations, and reactions to life situations. Active directed techniques, challenge belief system, self-awareness, therapeutic relationship, this collaborative relationship between the parent and the therapist and as a teacher and a role model. Psychological distress is largely a function of disturbances in cognitive processes. There is a focus on changing cognitions to produce desired changes in effect and behavior, and the patient needs to assume an active role. Cognitive behavior therapy is one of the few forms of psychotherapy that's been scientifically tested and found to be effective in hundreds of clinical trials for many different disorders. Cognitive therapy is usually focused on the present, it's time limited, 
and it's oriented towards problem solving. Patients learn specific skills that they can use for the rest of their lives. These skills involve identifying distorted thinking. So these are thinking errors, modifying a lot of their beliefs. Uh, some of these people, it was just how they were raised. You know, that was the message they received from their parents of certain messages. So, you know, really getting them to look at things from a different perspective and relating to others in different ways and changing behaviors. Limitations of cognitive behavior perspective is it doesn't encourage patients to address unfinished business. Personal warmth is not an essential effective therapy. There's a potential for transference. Less concerned with unconscious factors and ego defenses. Confrontational therapy advantage advantages and disadvantages, so it has both. Some contributions include self-responsibility in maintaining self-destructive ideas and attitudes, emphasis on putting newly acquired insights into action, teaches the patients to carry on, carry on their own therapy. So a lot of times if I've got a client who likes to read, I might recommend a good book for them to read that, that can be processed and comprehensive and eclectic therapeutic practice. Next is the family system perspective. These are all the family therapists here. We have Murray Bowen, Virginia Satir, Carl Whitaker, Salvador Minuchin, Jay Haley, Chloe Madanes, Tom Anderson, and Michael White. Cause of problem is understood by viewing the role of the family. Unresolved emotional fusion to one's family, emotionally detached therapist, teacher, model, coach, here and now interactions between the family members, and some techniques could include family mapping, enactments, and reframing. Some limitations to the family system perspective is the patient may be lost in their system and language, including dyads, triads, functional, dysfunctional, stuck and meshed and disengaged. So um, it's, it's good to define these terms for them before you get started so that they understand what these terms mean. And more research is needed on the family system perspective because it's not easy to get the family involved in treatment. So I, I at least try to get them to get one person who can be supportive that they spend most of their time with. Some contributions, it's neither the individual nor the family are blamed for a particular dysfunction. The family feels empowered and understanding within a system. So each person gets to understand their role and their place in their family system and what they can do to make changes in their, their family situation. An integrative perspective is creating an integrative stance is truly a challenge. It does not simply mean picking bits and pieces from theories in a random and fragmented manner. It is important to ask which theorists provide, theories provide a basis for understanding Thoughts, feelings, and behavior must have an accurate in-depth knowledge of each theory. You cannot integrate what you don't know. So it takes time to develop your own integrated perspective of how you are going to work with people. It takes great skill and training to know when, where, and why to use a particular intervention. This is a long-term venture, so it's lifelong. Look to your agency's leadership your supervisor and our colleagues for support and guidance. So if you're new to the profession and, and you need to consult on some approaches, a lot of times you may want to look up uh, some books so you can further educate yourself on the different perspectives that you use. And uh, the main thing is to be cautious and do no harm. Poll question number three, which of the theories are you most drawn to of all that we just covered? 
the psychoanalytic, the Adlerian, existential, person-centered, motivational interviewing, gestalt, choice reality, behavioral therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, family systems, and an integrated approach. If you want to drop your comments in the chat box, that would be good. Assessing readiness to change. In general, why do you think people change? Anybody, any comments? Motivation. What's that? Uh, motivations. Okay, yeah. Change. Yes, yes, they have to be internally motivated to want to change. I have something, if I can say something. If okay. You know, sometimes people are sad and they feel hopeless a little bit. And, um, mm -hmm. I'm not a counselor, <laughs> I'm a student, but um, from what I've experienced in my own life about changing, um, mm -hmm. you're just so tired and you want something different. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. They, they see, have the desire to want to have a different, more happy or content lifestyle than what they've been struggling with. I think this is pretty much about what, uh, just a different way of saying what everybody else has been saying is that with my clients, I notice either there's an internal pressure to change the status as is, or there's an external pressure forcing them to change the current status. So I think that pretty much says it's also that motivation to change, whether it's internal or external, depends on the situation and for individual. So, yep. Yes, I, I get the part where you're talking about they're coming to be in a program is often not something they voluntarily do. I very rarely get patients that come to my treatment program and say, I think I might have a problem and I want some help. It's usually people that are sent by the criminal justice system a majority of the time. Uh, Prochaska and Di Clemente, the stage of change where the stages of change were developed by psychologists Prochaska and Di Clemente in the 1980s in an effort to capture the change process in cigarette smokers in treatment. It has since been used to characterize changes in other addictive disorders, including alcoholism. Here is the stages of change model, Prochaska and Di Clemente's cycle of change, which is understanding the readiness to change. Provide, this provides clinicians with important considerations for intervention. So we might start out with our patient who's had a relapse and well, let's back up. Let's go to pre-contemplation. They're thinking they might be having a problem and then contemplation, they take it a step further of like, I really do have a problem. I, you know, maybe they'll start looking into where they can go to get help. And then going into the preparation stage, so they may have decided that they are going to change and they're going to start gathering information to support their change. And we will want to work with them to put a plan together. So patient readiness is 50 to 75%. And so then they move into the action stage, which is the working, the plan, the change is new and they're struggling with reformulating and needing a lot of support and encouragement. So we need to be their cheerleaders. The readiness at this stage is 75 to 100%. So they're, they're ready to take action and get going with their changing their life. And then on to the maintenance. We have been in the new behavior for quite a while, at least six to 12 months, usually more like one or two years. We feel pretty competent in the new behavior but need to keep reinforcing the support and action plan. And the readiness here is 100%. And then we have the relapse. We go back to the problem behavior, which can be for a very short time or for a long time. And there 
is a myth out there that not everybody gets through treatment without having a relapse. I've seen several not relapse at all. And I've also seen those that don't want, don't really want to change. They're just there. I often ask them if they're, if they're here to change their life or are, are they just doing, doing time? And, and a lot of them have been pretty honest with me that they're just doing what they feel they need to do. On to self-disclosure and keeping clear boundaries. It's always good to ask yourself if what you're disclosing is for the benefit of the patient. Self-disclosure and keeping clear boundaries, it's sharing your personal emotional, emotional and experiential information. Self-disclosure on part of the counselor requires careful consideration. Consider what other alternatives you have Patient needs always come first, so we don't want to do any harm. So a little bit of self-disclosure is good. You don't need to tell them your whole life story. And you might want to just say, you know, I, I've been through a similar situation. Would, would, you, would you like to hear about that a little bit? Um, and maybe they're dealing with kids. I, I get this quite often and they might say their teenagers are driving them crazy and they won't do this and they won't do that. And maybe I might share, I, I, I can totally relate to that. I've, I've raised some kids myself and at that age, they can be challenging. So it's good to um, sometimes share a little bit with them, but to be careful when you do that. And, and it, I was always told if you're gonna do it, Ask yourself, is this, how is this therapeutic to the client? How is this going to help them? Self-disclosure and keeping clear boundaries. You want to slow down or even could, this could slow down or stop the sharing process. The patient may lose confidence in the counselor and the patient may move away from their self-focus. So that's why you want to keep it brief and not share too much, not too soon into the treatment programming. You wanna give them some time to feel comfortable before you disclose some information about yourself. And some research here is how often did informal discussion occur? So there was a research study done with 736 individuals using motivational interviewing and motivational enhancement therapy sessions were rated. 42% of all sessions included some informal discussion. So this is kind of your kind of off the topic here now. On average, discussions occurred once or twice a session. 68% of clinicians had informal discussions three or more times in at least one of their sessions. So that, that's pretty big. And 20% of clinicians initiated informal discussions in 75% or more of their sessions. This may be helpful, but oftentimes it, it's not necessary. Sometimes it helps to break the ice and get the session going. Self-disclosure guidelines. It says, wait, consider first, why am I telling? It's like I said, keep it brief. Research suggests that long and drawn out narratives are considered by patients to be both unhelpful and damaging to the therapeutic relationship. So keep it brief and to the point. Using I statements, make it clear that you, get, you are giving your opinion based on your experiences only. It can be easy for patients to assume that you are referring to their clinical experience and expertise, and this can be misguiding. Self-disclosure guidelines, consider your patient's values. Making disclosures that you know are not aligned with your patient's values are also considered to be potentially damaging to the therapeutic relationship as it can cause the patient to feel alienated. Think about whether your disclosure is something they can relate to by considering whether it fits within their value system. 
Consider the impact of what you're going to disclose. Will the disclosure cause the patient to feel burdened? For example, revealing to a patient your father recently passed away could make the patient feel as though they can't discuss with you their own relationship issues with their father. As such, it's important for the patient to see that you are okay. The pros of self-disclosure, it builds rapport and trust, provides validation, can help the patient to feel normal, can reduce the power differential, differential between the clinician and the client and reduce intimidation, which can be useful when working with children and teenagers. Helps the patients as though feel as, they're not, as though they're not alone, provides a role model for appropriate social interaction, and it's important for clients who may experience social anxiety. Cons, self-disclosure can compromise the professional relationship. The patient views the counselor more as a friend. So we have to be mindful of the job that we are doing and that this is not a friendship and keep your boundaries. Move the folk can move the focus away from the client, can create role confusion. The patient may feel burdened and they may hold back or censor their information. The patient may feel the counselor is too involved and can pressure the patient into disclosing when they are not ready by creating expectations. So we don't want to push them into doing anything they're not ready to do. Poll question number four, how helpful do you think informational conversations are in therapeutic? conversations. So this is informal conversation. Is it a little helpful, moderately helpful, or very helpful? So we all have our own opinions. I think it's a little helpful just to maybe start your session off of how they're doing or how their holiday was. I think this week I'm asking how was their Easter? Moving on to cultural and ethnic issues. Culture is a key element which enhances opportunity for change. What is culture? Everything that people have, think, and do as members of a community or society, material objects, ideas, values, attitudes, and behavioral patterns, a template, that shapes behavior and consciousness within human society. Culture is dynamic, shared, and learned. One's culture is shaped by history, religion, ethnicity, and race, and geography, and group membership as a subculture. The addressing model, what does it do? It gives us a framework for understanding the effect of diverse cultural influences on therapists and patients. Worldview helps us recognize the areas where we identify with the dominant group versus various minority groups become aware, more aware of how identification with dominant group can limit knowledge and experience of groups we do not identify with. Why is it important? Knowledge of patients' salient identities gives clues to how the patient sees the world, what they value, how they may behave in certain situations, how others treat them, the more we know, the closer our hypothesis will be to the patient's realities, the greater our credibility, efficiency, and accuracy. Here is the addressing model. It starts off with age and generational influences. For example, when I was born, what were the social expectations for a person of my identity? 
when I was a teen, what were the norms, value, gender roles supported within my family, by my peers, my culture, and the dominant culture. Looking at developmental disability, what are my experiences with disability? So we have to look at our experiences with that. And then there's also disability acquired later in life. As people age, they can have hearing problems and vision problems. And some people it may be even uh, their mobility. We want to consider the religion and spiritual orientation of the clients that we're working with. Some of them may not uh, believe in any religion, but consider themselves to be spiritual. We want to consider the socioeconomic status sexual orientation, what is your own current sexual orientation and how has that varied across your lifespan? And do others assume I have a particular sexual orientation? I is the indigenous heritage. Do I have indigenous heritage? This may be an important part of another ethnic identity such as indigenous plus Hispanic is a different experience than Hispanic alone. We may have different consequences. Indigenous heritage, we may, some may have the heritage, but be unaware of their culture. So some people who are raised maybe away from their families or off the reservation may feel uh, like they're disconnected and they wanna reconnect. We wanna consider the national origin and also the gender. So knowing your gender, how your roles, responsibilities, and expectations affect your relationships with your patients. Privilege versus oppression. We all have addressing areas of privilege as we just covered and oppression. We tend to be more aware of areas of oppression privileged areas present a greater challenge for therapists. We need to consciously work to increase our awareness about our areas of privilege. Increasing our awareness is investigating our own cultural heritage. Pay attention to the influence of privilege on our understanding of cultural issues and work with patients. Educate ourselves through diverse sources of information. Develop sustained diverse relationships by learning from the diverse groups, not simply learning about the diverse groups. This is Dwayne McKay, Ed D. Um, I can't pronounce his name. I think it's Waktaya Naji meaning one who stands guard. Um, he was a part of the Prairie Lands ATTC American Indian Initiative Regional Coordinator who dedicated his work to providing education to enhance knowledge to better serve Native Americans. So I think that's really good that he's got this award for excellence for his, his work. It is important to increase our Native people's knowledge. Some basic information on Native Americans. There are 574 federally recognized American Indian tribes and Alaska Native groups in the United States. More than 250 different languages, different cultures, traditions, histories, and identities. In 2010 census, 5.2 million people identified as American Indian or Alaska Native alone or in combination with another race up from 4.1 million in 2000. So that's a huge increase. And the estimated Indian health services population is 2 million. These are some examples of nations, tribes, and bands uh, with the Dakota, Lakota, Nakota tribes in the Sioux Nation. 
So there are the Santee bands, the Teton bands, and the Yankton bands. So a lot of it has to do with where they live and how they live. Land transfers from Native Americans to white. So if you see in 1775, all of that dark territory was Indian country. And it's not very much later, just a little over 100 years later, it's almost all gone. So all these dots you see on this side, this west side are usually our reservations that you see. And I'm looking at mine, we're in Wyoming. So that big square there, we have two and a half million acres on the Wind River Reservation there. Native American cultural values are to have harmony with the environment. We are part of a larger system. We have great respect for our elders. Our children are the future and the, the importance of helping others. It's not always about ourselves. Uh, as I did my own research, uh, the students I interviewed, their education was not for them alone. It was for their family and for the community and to help the people as I did myself. And we also focus on prayer and traditions. So prayer is a big part of Native life. Some interventions with Native Americans development of interventions must consider specific socio-political history, the continuing transfer of unresolved trauma and grief across generations, the socioeconomic conditions, current and past experiences of racism and oppression, and having grown up on the reservation and being raised by my grandparents, grandparents, this unresolved trauma, this intergenerational trauma, it, it, this is very real. And genetic research is also showing that it can be genetically transferred. And when I talk about the unresolved trauma, my grandparents were both in the boarding schools. Uh, I am also a survivor of the Sand Creek uh, massacre. Some of my family members were there and that was close to the Wyoming, Colorado border here where uh, my tribe lived in Denver, Colorado. That was our homeland. And when the government came to take over, we were just in the way, the Arapahoes were in the way. So they attempted to massacre us. They wanted to kill us all. And um, that has had devastating impacts on our, on our tribe and, and our people to this, to this very day. And a lot of elders are, they still tell stories about these times in their life. Tips for the clinician is to be aware of the many ways of perceiving, understanding and approaching health, wellness and healing. Be careful not to misinterpret, stereotype or otherwise mishandle encounters. Be aware that ethnicity is used to stereotype diversity and can lead to distrust. Assess the degree of acculturation in the target group. Seek to become more culturally responsive and take the risk to discover your own biases and stereotypes. So when we go back to assess the degree of acculturation in the target group, so we always want to be looking at this person to consider, is this person come from a traditional background? Do they come from a traditional home? Uh, they speak the language, they practice all of their traditions, they probably live in their tribal community, or are they bicultural? Do they function well? I call it the real world off the reservation and being able to go back to the reservation and kind of walking in two worlds. And I've often called it the real world when anything comes about referring to being off the reservation. So it's being able to assess that person because not everybody wants to persist, participate in uh, cultural activities. And back home, 
Um, the sweat lodge is commonly used in both of the treatment programs on the reservation and a lot of the clients love it, but then some of them just, they're not, they're not very interested in it. So we can't force anybody to do what they're not interested in doing. Cultural considerations, some tips for becoming culturally responsive is your primary source of cultural information should be your patient. Multicultural skills must be personalized. You can learn from your mistakes. You can learn to reframe problems, recognize your own biases and cultural perceptions, view psychological problems as social constructs. And to summarize all of this, we covered counselor development. We went over the micro counseling skills. We talked about several counseling theories to give you an introduction to them. We discussed self-disclosure and keeping clear boundaries. So it's important to be mindful of what you're going to share and to be in control of your counseling situation so that they don't feel like you're not there to be friends with your patient. You're there to help them. You are their guide, you are their teacher. And we also covered the cultural and ethnic issues with the more focus on the Native American population. Any thoughts, ideas, or questions? We've had quite a bit of <clears throat> uh, comments and, and thoughts, uh, ideas in the chat, uh, Dr. Garcia. So it's been very engaging for I think okay. our audience. Um, but we have a few minutes, so I could open the floor okay. um, to questions. If anyone has questions, or want to have her circle back to maybe a, something she talked about earlier. Um, and just as a note, I did post in the chat uh, the link to our uh, short survey. If you have a few moments to complete that at the conclusion of today's broadcast, I would really appreciate that. If not, we'll reach out to you via email with uh, another opportunity to do so along with a PDF version of today's PowerPoint uh, and some other supplemental uh, handouts, I think that Dr. Garcia had uh, pertaining to today's uh, presentation. So I'm going to open the floor. We have a few minutes. Uh, open the floor. I did want to acknowledge a couple of our advisory council members were here with us today. Uh, David Natsaway is here, uh, as well as uh, Dr. Dan Foster. So great to see both of them in attendance today. Thanks, guys. Lots and lots and lots of questions here. They're moving so fast, I can't keep up with them. Um, okay. Let me go scroll through some of these questions here. Someone is asking for a recommendation for a good assessment for trauma. And I have been working on a trauma series. Next week, I will present uh, some brain-based uh, treatment interventions uh, on trauma. The assessments are not coming right off the top of my head right now, but one that I use at work is the Addiction Severity Index. Uh, that's what we use for our substance abuse evaluations here in Wyoming. And there are about four or five questions on that assessment that are specific to looking at trauma and PTSD in patients. But if you attend my training next week on uh, the brain-based uh, trauma interventions, I will uh, make sure that I add those. I know early in the series on trauma, I did provide a lot of uh, assessments there. So um, I believe they've been posting 
a lot of these on YouTube. So if you could look up the first session, this next one that I'm gonna do next week will be the third of five. Okay. I'm glad most of you like this. It's very good information if you're preparing for the exam or you just wanna refresh your, your skills as a therapist. Okay, yeah, this is some... a lot of information and uh, we, yeah. we will make this uh, available in a PDF format so you could review this uh, at a later time. And we've also recorded today's event. Uh, this will be available on our uh, HTC uh, secure YouTube website um, that I'm certainly happy to post a link to that. It's got okay. a lot of our recorded uh, presentations over the past uh, couple of years. So it's you can really pick and choose what you'd like to, to view. If you're interested in CEUs, you can request those for today. We will offer 1.5 NADAC approved CEUs. Uh, we can't offer them uh, if you view this as a recording. So that's the one note I would put out there. Okay. Someone made a comment of some areas, the dominant culture is not the privileged culture. That's a very interesting comment. Um, I, I, I would assume that this would refer to if I were to go home to the reservation, being on the reservation would be the dominant culture and then the other culture that, that would not be dominant would be the non-native community. And I do have seen counselors come and go from the reservation for all the years I've been there. Uh, a majority of them are not native. So I see it as they struggle with making that connection with the people. And just like this presentation covered, it's, it's good to learn from your, the people that you work with. And when I talk about Native American work, I talk from my own experience with uh, the Arapaho people and the Shoshone people from the reservation because I can't speak for all tribes. Like I mentioned earlier, we all have different languages. We have different ways of, of doing things. We all like our different foods. And uh, so there are a lot of differences between tribes and being raised by my grandparents who were both Northern Arapaho. I I, that, that's a majority of my upbringing and that, that's my foundation of where I operate from. My dad was uh, Eastern Shoshone and he, I don't know, he was a police officer on the reservation for many, many years. And it wasn't until he got older that he was very fascinated by going to powwows. So that became his favorite thing to do was, was going to powwows. He, he really enjoyed that. So as do I, I miss it. <laughs> but thanks everyone. This has been really great to see so many people interested in this. To any of you who are preparing to sit for the exam every month, the first Wednesday of each month, I will present another one of these essential skills for, for counseling to help people prepare for the exam. So uh, thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedules to be here today. I, I really appreciate it. Uh -oh. Thank you. And thank you to all of the participants today. We really appreciate your time and attention. And until we meet again, uh, please stay safe, uh, stay connected and, and stay healthy. We'll see you again. Uh, I did post the link to our YouTube page and uh, as well as the survey link again. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me here at the center or visit our webpage at htc.org. Uh, great to see everyone. Take care. Thanks again, Dr. Garcia. We'll, we'll see you again. See ya.